Hello everyone and welcome to today's webinar in the third of 10 ESCCP webinar series. My name is Rula Deep. I'm a principal at Geosynta Consultants in Oakland, California and the organizer of the webinar series on behalf of CERDAP and ESCCP. I will be facilitating today's call. The webinar will consist of a brief overview of CERDAP and ESCCP by Dr. Herb Nelson, followed by a listing of a few of the upcoming webinars in the webinar series. Following Herb's opening remarks, we will transition to the technical portion of the webinar. Today's webinar features two speakers who will discuss factors affecting munitions mobility underwater and in situ measurements. First, Dr. Carl Friedrichs from the Virginia Institute of Marine Science will discuss factors affecting munitions mobility. He'll be followed by a brief Q&A session. Second, Dr. Joseph Calantoni from the Naval Research Laboratory will talk about in situ measurements of munitions mobility. He will also be followed by a brief Q&A session. We plan to conclude the webinar with an interactive Q&A session, including both our speakers. Today's broadcast will be listen only. You may submit questions by using the chat box on the left-hand portion of your screen. You do not need to wait until the Q&A period to submit your questions. In fact, we encourage you to submit your questions in advance of these sessions. With over 160 attendees on today's call, it is logistically challenging to open up all the lines for oral questions. Therefore, your phone lines will remain listen only throughout the presentation. With that, I would like to introduce Dr. Herb Nelson, who has been serving as the CERDAP and ESCCP Program Manager for Munitions Response since 2007. Prior to that, Herb was a research chemist at the Naval Research Lab in Washington, where his work focused on the detection and classification of buried UXO. And with that, I turn it over to you, Herb. Thank you, Rula. So as Rula said, I will begin with a brief introduction to CERTIP and ESTCP for those of you that are new to us. CERTIP, or the Strategic Environmental Research and Development Program, is the R&D part of our portfolio here at uh, CERTIP and ESTCP office. Uh, this works on, in DOD words, from uh, 6.1 to 6.3 projects, uh, research, from uh, basic research through sort of the brass board area. We focus on advanced technology development for uh, near-term needs, and as it says in the bottom uh, bullet, also fundamental research that gets us ready to that advanced development stage. The other half of our office is the Environmental Security Technology Certification Program, or ESCCP. And this is a demonstration validation program where we demonstrate innovative, uh, cost-effective environmental energy technologies. Often these capitalize on our past investments, but other technologies come to us from other uh, initial funding. And this is really meant to transfer technology out of the lab and into the regulatory acceptance area into use on Navy or Air Force or Army facilities. We are managed or we manage ourselves, I guess, in five program areas in CERTIP and ESCCP, energy and water, which is ESCCP only, and then the remaining four, environmental restoration, munitions response, resource conservation and climate change, and weapon systems and platforms are both have both a CERTIP and an ESCCP component. The uh, topic of today's presentation falls under the munitions response program area. We are really broken down into two um, major sub areas. Number one, munitions on land. And that sub area is really coming to a conclusion this year. We're finishing up our classification applied to munitions response efforts. We have a few more demonstrations in our demonstration program, and then we will be out of the munitions on land business. And we'll be transferring almost all of our uh, resources to munitions underwater. The munitions underwater part of our program has three main subcomponents. We're looking at, at wide area and detailed surveys. So wide area surveys to find areas of concern, to find missing target areas, detailed surveys to catalog individual munitions. We also have a component of the program 
that addresses cost-effective recovery and disposal of munitions underwater. And then the final part of the uh, program, which is the topic of today's webinar, we are studying the characteristics of munitions underwater, the environment they exist in, and their mobility. And that's the point of today's seminar. Before I get into a little more detail about what's going to be talked about today, I just want to point out to everyone on the phone that there is an uh, outstanding ESCCP call looking for innovative technology transfer approaches. You can see some details about it in the bullets here. A proposal is due next week, so if this is the first you've heard of it, you're going to have to get it going. There's a lot more information on our website, and there was a separate webinar the week before last on the uh, details and possible questions about this uh, technology transfer solicitation, so I would refer you to our website if you would like to get more detail about it. So uh, here is the upcoming, I'm sorry, I hit that twice. Here is the upcoming uh, 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 set of webinars that we have coming up. See, there's a lot of them that are, uh, I think will be of interest to people on this uh, call. If you, you will be getting emails along to remind you to register for these, so please, if you find some on this list that look good to you, please register and attend. You can see the top one, of course, is the one that's uh, Ministry of Constituents. That's the one that's the uh, call, the uh, webinar after this. So now before I go on, I will give you the website for that. We can go find that table that I just showed you. So now before I go on to the speakers, and we're starting with Carl, of course, let me just give you a quick overview of the, of the uh, munitions mobility portion of our program, and this will set up the reasons that the, the two speakers have been chosen and the work that they're going on are, are good examples of what's going on in this part of our program. So we're really looking at munitions mobility and underwater environments. We think that a significant component of the CERTA program is devoted to this, and, we, and it is devoted to that because we think that in many cases, underwater munition sites will be managed in place. There's a lot of cases where it won't make sense to try to recover, but we'll manage them in place. One thing that, are, that would be required to manage munition sites underwater in place is an engineering level model that can be used by site managers that gives them some indication of when that munitions field may have moved, under what environmental conditions, a bad storm comes through, a, a hurricane, something may have affected that. So in our mind, there are really three components to this. Number one, we need to understand the factors that lead to the initiation of, of motion of uh, munitions that are, had been deposited underwater, and if they start moving, how far will they move? Number two is constructing the model. We need to construct a model that will be, uh, will be able to transition to site managers, but to have confidence in that model, we have to do the third step, which is acquire some data to mo validate those models, that model or those models, depending on how it works out. So the seminar today is, uh, concerns the first and the third of those. Carl Friedrichs will uh, take care of topic number one that I just saying, understanding some of the factors that lead to uh, munitions mobility underwater, and then we'll move to uh, Joe Calantonia, number three, who has been making some in situ measurements to try to gather data that we will both help us understand what's going on and will be data that we can use to validate our model. So with that, we'll get started. I'll transfer, I'm sorry, I keep hitting that twice in both directions. We'll transfer to Carl Friedrich. Sorry, Carl, I hope you're better at the slides than I was. Thank you, Herb. And it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Carl Friedrichs. Carl is the chair of the Physical Sciences Department at the Virginia Institute of Marine Science. He's also a professor at the School of Marine Science at the College of William and Mary. At VIMS, Carl studies coastal and estuarine processes. He also teaches graduate courses in physical oceanography and marine geology and directs the Coastal Hydrodynamics and Sediment Dynamics Laboratory. Carl has authored over 80 peer-reviewed publications on topics related to coastal oceanography. He is a recipient of the Commonwealth of Virginia Outstanding Faculty Award and also the White House Presidential Early Career Award for Scientists and Engineers. And with that, I'll turn it over to you, Carl. Thank you very much, Rula. Thank you, Herb. Um, first, let me apologize in advance. I've never operated this technology before. I'm coming to the 21st century here with a webinar, so I will probably be double-clicking. Okay, so yes, I'll be talking about factors affecting munitions 
mobility underwater. Uh, before this project began, uh, the existing data on the mobility of UXO-like objects had not been effectively compiled and synthesized. You'll be seeing the abbreviation UXO a lot in my presentation. It stands for Unexplored Ordnance, and it's interchangeable with underwater munitions in the context of this presentation. A lack of robust parameterizations based on a wide range of data can limit DOD predictions, although this presentation expands on the previously compiled data range to include both natural and man-made objects. There are certainly additional parameter ranges that need continued study beyond the ones I'll be discussing, including, for example, the effect of UXO density relative to the surrounding sediment. In the next talk today, Joe Calantoni will be very appropriately emphasizing the role of UXO density relative to the surrounding sand. In terms of limitations of previous studies, previous studies of UXO mobility had not effectively considered the role of seabed roughness, for example, which will be a focus of my talk today. Also, previous parameterizations have assumed governing dimensionless numbers to be relevant without necessarily connecting them back to the underlying physics. So I'll also be doing that. So my technical objectives today include uh, describing how we've compiled data on uh, UXO-like object mobility using the geological literature, including the movement of gravel and cobbles. From coastal engineering, we've learned about forces on pipelines, which are relevant to cylindrical objects on the seabed. From DOD research, some work has been done on cylinders in flumes, and the mine burial program at ONR provided very useful information. The idea here is to develop simple physics-based relationships. I'm using an approach where I take a balance of forces at initial object movement. I'm also examining the scour of sediment by eddies shed by UXO. And then I'll briefly talk about ongoing work on the movement of sediment across UXO. Uh, the goal is to provide these formulations to a DOD expert system that's being developed with our clo my close collaboration with Sarah Rennie and Alan Brandt. And I'll be mentioning that collaboration along the way during this talk. So the technical approach is compiling existed data on mobility of underwater UXO and UXO-like objects. So I used a lot of Google and Google Scholar. Uh, looked through the electronic journal bases, found some very interesting information in unpublished dissertations, got some very old books by L Interlibrary Loan, and uh, this incorporated results from field and laboratory experiments. Some just some pictures from the some of the papers on the left is an uh, example of looking at initiation of motion of cobbles and boulders in streams, and on the right are some examples of uh, scour induced burial of cylinders in a laboratory. So in compiling existing data on mobility of UXO-like objects, uh, I looked at the initial motion of objects larger than the surrounding sediment, if any. This uh, plot shows a summary of the data I found on critical velocity of object motion on the y-axis. So that means the velocity of the water under which the object started to move. And then on the x-axis, the diameter of the object. By saying it's surrounding sediment, if any, is a lot of the data is from flumes where there was no sediment. But the X's, for example, are field measurements of natural sediment, where people were looking at cobbles and gravel moving through a bed of sand or smaller sediment. Um, so the main point here is the huge span of critical velocities for initiation of motion. If you look at the 10 centimeter line, for example, on the X axis for a diameter of object, Depending on the conditions, it could start moving at 4 centimeters per second if it was, say, a cylinder in a flume without any roughness on the bed. Or it could take 200 uh, centimeters per second if it's a cobble in a natural stream. So we want to try to understand that variability. Um, so another thing we looked at is uh, the second aspect was object scour depth. Uh, something that happens if there's sand around an object is the velocity of the water produces eddies, which enhance the turbulence and move sediment away from the object. So on the y-axis here is object scour depth in centimeters. And on the, the x-axis is wave orbital velocity. And these are observations that were done in, uh, either in flumes under waves on sandy bottoms, the green squares, or field data from the mine burial program from ONR with cylinders uh, on the continental shelf. And there's a lot of scatter again. So if you look at, say, 50 centimeters per second for wave orbital velocity, depending on the conditions of sediment 
and cylinder, you might have a burial of only 3 centimeters or 50 centimeters. So again, we want to try to understand why there's so much variability. So ongoing work involves, uh, and it's not complete at this point, but it's, so I'll just be telling, talking about it as a, the next subject of interest is the effects of moving sediment across UXO, especially changes in the bed condition. This is an example of a work from the 90s showing large uh, coarse sediment ripples moving across bottom objects. Uh, and on the right-hand side is an is a idealized model for a kinetic sort of approach, where kinematic approach, where the ripples migrate across the object, and the object ends up uh, as low, a little bit lower than the lowest part of the bed form trough, and then reappears later as the bed form migrates. So then another important aspect of the technical approach is providing the formulations that come from it to an expert system being developed by Sarah Rennie and Alan Brandt. Uh, their completed portion of their project was called the Underwater Munitions Expert System to Predict Mobility and Burial. Um, Rennie and Brandt are building an expert system to provide managers guidance in determining the probabilities that UXO will have moved or been buried depending on past environmental conditions. The parameterizations I'm helping develop aim to be part of the decision tree in their probabilistic software system. Rennie's group and I have worked, uh, Rennie, Sarah Rennie and Alan Brandt's group and I have worked closely together in constraining mobility parameters over the last three years and we hope to continue working in the future. So now I want to move on to results. The initial movement of UXO is the first part of my results in terms of theoretical development and application, and then the second section of the results will be on scour depth. So he, the approach I'm taking is a balance of forces at initial object movement, and it's based on, it builds from work that was started in initiation of uh, sediment grain movement, like gravel grains in rivers especially, and also on the seabed. It involves balancing important forces near the seabed, moving objects, such as the lift force, the drag force, the inertia force, and object weight. And the question then is, when does a seabed object move? And the idea is that it begins to move when the sum of forces in the x direction, which is along the seabed, are greater than the sum of the forces in the vertical times a friction a parameter, tan phi. And the reason it's tan phi, where phi is called the friction angle, is because there's an analogy to when objects will start to move due to angle of repose if the bed is steep enough. But in general, tan phi is a friction coefficient relating the effect of forces in x tendency to dislodge things relative to forces in Z. It's simple to keep in the bed slope beta, but it's usually negligible compared with the other parameters in a lot of our applications. So from this point forward, I'll be dropping the bed slope. That leaves the equation in the bottom of the page, the sum of the mobilizing forces from drag, inertia, and lift uh, equal the resistant force due to weight at the time that the object begins to move. So continuing to the parameterization of forces at the time of initial motion, um, again, the object begins to move when the sum of the disturbing forces equals the sum of the stabilizing forces times this friction uh, parameter. There's standard ways of parametrizing these forces from the engineering literature that involve uh, drag co uh, coefficients of drag, lift, and inertia. And they're all multiplied, well, for drift, and lift, they're multiplied times the velocity squared times an area. And then for inertia, it has to do with acceleration and a volume. And then weight has to do with the relative density of the object and its volume. So the next step in the derivation is to substitute in these uh, standard uh, formulations for the forces. And then solve for the force of drag relative to the force of stabilizing weight. And um, that's because in uh, most cases, the inertia force and the uh, lift force are secondary. So to simplify things, that's what we're doing. So what we see here is the result of that division and simplification. And what comes is a number that's appeared for many years in the sediment transport literature. And that's the object mobility number theta with a sub zero for object. And it's proportional to the drag force divided by the weight force. Um, this, 
and on the right hand side ends up being the friction parameter, tan phi, divided by the relative exposure of the object, E over D. And then the FI and the FL are small parameters that we won't be discussing here, but additional research we're doing involves their careful formulation as well. But the main point is the red box at the bottom right hand corner which shows the mobility number at its critical value is going to be about equal to the friction parameter tan phi divided by the relative exposure. And for the special case of objects that are pivoting around an angle, then that, that angle is actually known uh, from angle of repose and can be solved exact, more or less exactly, but in many conditions uh, it's more of a friction parameter than a pivot angle. So I want to talk now about the effect of bed roughness, which we call K on initial mov movement. Uh, the past work in uh, initiation of UXO motion hadn't particularly considered the bed roughness, but it had been recognized in sediment transport. And these are some modified diagrams from the sediment transport literature. And if we start over on the right, you can see a cartoon of various size objects sitting on a rough bed. And at the bottom, you can see the small D over K value. That's where the roughness K is dominating. You can see how it could be hard to move some of those particles because they're blocked by the bottom roughness. But as we move up in the cartoon, you see a larger D over K ratio and those objects are much more exposed to the flow and would be easier to move. So if we go over to the uh, right, you can see how those different parameters can be measured from the geometry of the bed where the roughness K is pretty close. There's a factor involved, but it's pretty close to the size of the, obje the objects that form up the seabed. And of course, D is the size of the Art of the object E is the amount it's exposed, and you can see that that C has a real meaning when the objects are pivoting against each other. So continuing with relating the critical mobility number to the bed roughness, here's a cartoon that shows three cases of progressively larger diameter objects sitting on a rough bed. And just from the cartoon, I've estimated values of this uh, relative roughness uh, D over K going from 0.5 at the top to, to 2.0 at the bottom. And you can evaluate the friction angle phi. It decreases as D over K increases from the cartoon and the exposure increases as the size of the object increases, all else being equal. So we can go through the logic of how that would apply to the quantitative parameterization of the critical mobility number. Uh, we, it, starting on the left, moving down from the top there, we see as the ratio D over K goes up, the object's being exposed and it's easier to move. As um, that ratio is going up, the friction angle in the cartoon is going down. And as that ratio D over K is going up, the object exposure is going up. So tan phi and the exposure ratio appear in the critical mobility parameter, which means the critical mobility parameter is going to go down as D over K increases. So that means we should be able to predict the critical velocity u squared there as a function of um, d over k if we have some data on d over k. So that's what I'm going to be showing on the next page. We have on the left the original data set with all that scatter of critical velocity of motion of what the water that's needed to move things versus the object diameter on the x-axis. Now if we switch the vertical axis to the mobility parameter theta sub zero, the dots represent, the, the marks represent the, the times of the, the velocities plugged in for the critical initiation of motion. And it's plotted on the x-axis versus d over k. We now see that the scatter is greatly reduced and there isn't this crazy overlap at a given di diameter where you have a factor of 50 in velocity that could change. These are data that include everything from field measurements of sediment and natural systems to cylinders uh, on uh, firm bottoms and flumes. Um, so the, although it seems like there's, the, although there's about an order of magnitude still scatter in the mobility parameter, that's the square of velocity. So in terms of velocity itself, we're down to a scatter from maximum to minimum of, of about three, down from a factor of 50. So that's a step in the right direction. Although there is a significant gap in the parameter space, and that's what I'm going to talk about next. Uh, we've been collaborating with uh, uh, Rennie and Brandt and uh, providing them at the end of year one of our project uh, these parameterizations which uh, help motivate them to pick the right parameter space to do uh, 
experiments utilizing cylinders in the lab, and that's shown at the bottom right. What they did, which is, was really insightful, was to vary the roughness on the cylinders and on the seabed um, and collect a parameter range of D over K that didn't exist before. And then as you move to the cartoon on the bottom left, that shows the graphic on the bottom left, it shows some illustrations from a report from August 2013 on their initial results with adding the additional parameter space, which was really helpful. So then that fed back to me in year two and continued the, um, the uh, uh, continued derivation of more precise relationships. So this shows uh, before the parameter space was added and then afterwards with the results of, of Rennie and Brandt. And it, they did a very nice job of filling in the parameter space for the size of objects relative roughness. Uh, showing a pretty consistent pattern of when motion is predicted for seabed objects versus when it's not predicted uh, as a function of D over K showing the critical mobility parameter. Um, so that's the end of my section on results for deriving scour induced burial parameters, sorry, uh, initiation of motion parameters, and now I'm going to move on to scour induced burial of UXO. And here's a cartoon from Demir and Garcia's work uh, highlighting that the bed under UXOs is often not fixed in place. So the, the derivations I just showed work very well if you happen to have a fixed bottom, whether it's rough or smooth, so that the mo motion of the water isn't changing the bottom while the UXO is sitting on it. But in reality, in a pretty large parameter space of sandy bottoms, as the velocity increases, um, Eddies are scoured off the object, and it creates scour pits, and the object works its way down at the scour pit to some specific level. So this section of the talk is working on parameterizations that will help predict the scour-induced burial depth, which you see as B in that cartoon. So we also would expect perhaps the sediment type to make a difference here too. So you, building on the results from the first half of the talk where we found the mobility parameter, which we call the object mobility parameter in that case, to be so important for initiation of motion of the objects. Here we're interested in the initiation of motion of the sediment around the objects. So instead of using an object mobility parameter, we use a um, sediment mobility parameter. So it's the same relationship derived in the same way as previously, but on the bottom right, we've replaced the capital D for the object size with a little d for the sediment size. Also, the, uh, so we, we've um, actually, yeah, there's a typo there. That should be the density of the sediment down in that uh, denominator too, not the density of the object. Anyway, we're basically replacing the parameters of the object with the parameters of the sediment. And when we you do that and then replot the data as a function of B over D, the fractional burial depth, we see that this data that had been quite scattered for a large range of cylinder sizes and velocities collapses to a pretty well-constrained line for this range of uh, di diameters for um, a collection of different sand sizes. So that uh, seems like we're in a good track. I also meant to mention that if you had looked at the abstract, I had emphasized something called the, the shields parameter for my discussion. The mobility parameter is another name for the shields parameter. And um, I've emphasized the use of the word mobility parameter, which is used in the coastal engineering literature also, because it's more closely related to what it's representing than, although Mr. Shields deserves a lot of credit. He was a brilliant man. All right. Um, so uh, Rennie and Brandt also were doing experiments on uh, scour-induced burial of cylinders, and they wanted to make sure that their data was falling in the same parameter space as the literature so they could build on it. And here's some examples of the fractional burial depth they measured uh, as a function of the um, sediment mobility parameter. And the red triangles from their work fall nicely on the same uh, trends for working with similar size diameter cylinders. One of the nice things about these data is it was the first time that I'm aware of that this had been done with steady currents instead of waves. And it's important to see that the trends for under steady currents tend to be pretty similar to the trends under waves. Um, another thing that they expanded this work on was uh, then seeing once it had started to scour, will these objects move as the flow is accelerated? 
So that was a very important addition. And what they found was when they plotted objects that had partially scoured on the earlier plot that we had made, which was the object mobility parameter on the y-axis versus the um, object size relative to bottom roughs on the x-axis, when they used objects that had started to scour the red triangles here, these cylinders didn't move after the, if they had started to scour, even under accelerating flow. And that was an issue because now how can we use this prediction if it doesn't apply at all under conditions when objects are scouring, because object scour is quite common. So uh, Rennie and Brandt thought about how they could use the depth of scour to better uh, evaluate the roughness of the bed in an appropriate way. And they did a really creative thing where um, recognizing in this cartoon that an object that's partially buried is very, seems very similar in some ways to an uh, object that has roughness around it, we can think about that burial depth B replacing the bottom roughness K in the relationships for initial motion as a function of size relative to roughness. If we, uh, so here we have, again, the plot of the object mobility number on the y-axis and the diameter relative roughness on the x-axis. But now we've had recalculated K by the burial depth due to scour and replotted the location of these objects in the parameter space of D over K using the burial depth instead of the roughness of the sand on the bottom. And when you do so, nearly all the objects move to the no motion side of the predicted trend. And the one, a couple that didn't move were pretty close to the scatter of whether they would move or not. So this seems like this uh, innovative way of interpreting the bottom of the bed's roughness shows that scour inhibits mo motion by uh, increasing the effective roughness so that the things that govern um, motion, the friction parameter uh, goes up and the exposure amount goes down. So I'm now going to end with some conclusions and some description of hopeful future work. So basically to put it all together, uh, the mobility of UXO in a lot of cases is governed by the mobility uh, parameter for the sediment and the mobility parameter for the object. The mobility parameter for the sediment on the left-hand side along the x-axis governs how deeply an object will be scour buried in sand. And on the right-hand side, along with the roughness of the bed, the object mobility parameter can be used to predict whether the object will move or not. But of course, this ne neglects a lot. Some of those things will, uh, that we're neglecting, Joe will talk about. But I want to talk a little bit uh, more about uh, ongoing and future work that has to do with tracking these, which are called far field effects to a large degree. Um, so here's an example of the types of insights that have been put together in the geological literature. It, when folks are working in geology, they often go with, um, understandably, with dimensional units. So on the x-axis, we have just straight grain size in millimeter of the bed. And on the y-axis, we have flow velocity above the bed in meters per second. And you see, depending on how the size of the bottom and the flow velocity, you get a really complex and rich behavior of the bottom. And most of the cases I've been talking about so far are towards regime one, where the uh, the bottom's either firm or the object scour is dominating the movement of the bottom. So the main feature around an object is scour. But in regime two, when the bed starts to really deform due to the flow, you get all sorts of complex bed forms from small ripples up to sand waves in coarser sediment. And that's a regime where these objects, these uh, uh, bed forms could likely migrate over the objects and cover them up just from the bed changing. And then there's regime three, where the bed fluidizes, the, the um, bed forms move away. And here's getting towards the regime that Joe will be talking about, where the density object might make a big difference in the way it behaves. If it's low density, it'll move along with the liquidized bed as the bed moves along. But if it's a heavy object, it could sink into the bed. So this last slide shows um, some of the work that's been done in the geological engineering literature, some of it from way back. On the left-hand side is a cartoon from Fenstock in 1962, where they looked at uh, how cobbles and boulders are moved in sand streams. And they talked about regime two, 
where you have ripples and uh, sand waves, and they m migrate across the boulders or cobbles without moving them. But when you go into regime three, where you have a plain bed, the bed forms are washed out, the top of the bed is fluidizing, then cobbles and boulders, which are about the same density as sand, move downstream rapidly with the moving sediment. But they weren't considering heavier objects, so it's quite possible that heavier UXOs might sink into the bed rather than being infected downstream with the with the um, fluidized bed. So I will end there, and thank you for your attention, and we now have time for some questions. Thank you. Thank you, Carl, for a very informative presentation. I would like to remind our audience to submit questions by using the chat box on the left-hand portion of the screen. We have received a number of questions. The first one is from EPA and asks whether your method, Carl, can be used to predict whether UXO can be mobilized by propeller, propeller wash from large vessels such as cruise, cruise ships or ferries? That's a very interesting question. I hadn't ever thought of that. But the idea is that it's the velocity near the top of the object that makes a difference. And it works well for either waves or currents which are, of course, two natural sources of near-bed velocity. But there's no reason in my mind it shouldn't work well with prop wash, too. Um, it's certainly a, quite a rich literature on the effect of prop wash on shoreline erosion. That's why, oh, and bed resuspension, too. And that's why in so many coastal regions there will be a no-wake zones posted for boats. So it would follow that uh, large ships could easily create currents that could then, if the parameter range is correct, uh, be just as important or more important than waves or currents in mobilizing UXO. Great. Thank you, Carl. Another question. UXO in the marine environment will substantially degrade so that the cylinders will also be considerably roughened. This is the bed and the, that is the bed and the cylinders will both be roughened. How will this impact the conclusions of your study? That's another very good question, and actually that's something that uh, Rennie and Brandt addressed to some degree. They not only roughened the bed in their flumes, they also roughened the cylinders, and they found at lowest order that the roughness of the two add, uh, seemed at least in these preliminary measurements to add more or less linearly, so you can think of the roughness of the object being equivalent to the roughness of the bed in terms of causing, reducing the mobility. Another thing to think about, too, is it, I didn't emphasize it, but in my scatter plots, um, when the natural sediment was harder to move than the cylinders and spheres, even on the same bed roughness, and that's because of the increased angularity of those objects. So um, a rough UXO that had been corroded would tend to be more angular and qualitatively the, the mobility line would shift upward, sort of the way it does for natural sediment. And one could imagine a suite of mobility lines that were each a function of the roughness or angularity of the object. So if you had UXO that had fins on them, for example, they'd be a lot less mobile than those without. So they would have a conceptually a different mobility line that would be a function of the object angularity. Thank you, Carl. A related question, I assume the physical condition of the UXO item may impact, may impact its mobility. If that assumption is correct, at what age do you typically see UXO degradation? Well, I'm afraid that that question um, is outside my area of expertise. Um, perhaps Herb could jump in because he's been working on these issues a lot longer. Do you have an answer on how long you think uh, you, it takes for a typical UXO to degrade in a natural environment, Herb? Well, I have a, a not very good answer to that I don't think is going to satisfy the questioner. It really depends on what environment that is. Uh, UXO and sandy sediments spend a surprisingly high fraction of their time buried and tend not to uh, accumulate either biofouling or much degradation in much harder sediments where the uh, or coral, for example, where the UXO themselves just sit up on top. 
then you, that's where you see these crazy pictures of the biofouled and uh, corroded looking munitions. So you can't really give an answer to that. Obviously, we, we're playing with a long time, though. These things, in many cases, have been in the water since World War II or Korea training times. So even a very slow rate of uh, degradation, multiplied times 60 or so years, gives you a fair amount of degradation. Thank you both. Um, another question for you, Carl. How can the relationship you are deriving for predicting UXO mobility and burial be used to actually help remediate UXO contaminated sites? That question relates back to uh, my work in collaboration with Rennie and Brandt at the Johns Hopkins University. My work's being incorporated into their expert system, which is uh, in their next proposal is presently titled Underwater Munitions Expert System for Me Remediation Guidance. So my, re my relationships, along with relationships that Joe is providing from his work, which you'll be hearing about, will be part of the expert system that synthesizes databases and models of environmental conditions, along with an understanding of UXO behavior in response to environmental forcing. So I think the goal of the under the expert system is to predict the ca con contamination density or uh, more generally speaking the relative abundance of UXO across a specific site and its likelihood of mobility. Um, the idea I think is that the end user for the expert system would be managers directly responsible for UXO remediation. My understanding is uh, Rennie and Brandt have proposed a proof of concept for uh, their expert system to apply it in a test site involving multiple CERTIP investigators. I'm hoping that, I think that's a great idea and I would love to be involved with that. They would plan to incorporate end user feedback from the managers into the expert system, into its user interface and provide a user friendly user guide. So hopefully my work is going to be incorporated into this tool which can be effectively used to help remediate contaminated sites. Thank you so much, Carl. Um, another series of questions here. Mo mobility modeling uh, that you presented was for cylinders only. Do the same principles generally apply to spherical objects? Also, these models begin with cylinders oriented perpendicular to flow. But what happens if the cylinder begins parallel to flow? Do wave motion and flow tend to move the cylinder perpendicular to flow? Uh, those are great questions. Uh, among the data we were using did include uh, natural sediment, which tends to be sort of elliptoid, sort of potato shaped with various degrees of roughness. We also included available data on spheres as well as cylinders. Um, there's a bigger difference for the natural sediment and the cylinders. The spheres and the cylinders behaved surprisingly, well, not too surprisingly, they behaved quite similarly and because of their simple shapes, theoretically, you can constrain the, what's called the friction angle, the angle of repose a lot better. So um, that, those worked quite well. Um, other shapes will need more observations, Rennie and Brent, uh, Brandt are working with uh, tapered cylinders, which of course is a very relevant shape for artillery. Um, in terms of the orientation, it has been shown pretty well that um, the cylinders tend, if they're exposed to flow, tend to turn perpendicular to the flow. That's what I've tended to see in the literature. Uh, I know though that if you change the shape of the cylinder to be, for example, tapered on one end or have fins on the other end, then the resistance to the flow of the two ends of the cylinder changes and it tends to turn. So uh, pointed cylinders, tapered cylinders, similar to artillery shells, tend to turn somewhat more to the flow. And um, uh, I, if enough data were available, um, one could derive perturbations on the mobility constraints and burial predictions for additional shapes such as tapered cylinders and um, that is a good idea in terms of ongoing work because of the likelihood that a lot of these UXO have specific shapes that aren't simply cylinders. <laughs>
Great. Thank you, Carl. A couple of other quick questions. How does the depth of water or storm surge factor in? Um, it's important to keep track of the depth of water when you're calculating the flow immediately above the object. Often we have observations of wave height and period, and then you'd want to know the wave, the water depth, so you calculated the orbital velocity near the bed correctly because the orbital, uh, orbital velocity decays in a known way with depth. Um, similarly, in uh, current flow, you'll have an observation often or a calculation that often at some height well above the object and you need to know the depth so you can properly calculate the decrease of velocity as you go down due to what's called a log layer profile and uh, that's quite important and has been looked at quite a bit in the sediment transport literature and that's one of the ways the, the shield parameter which is used a lot in sediment transport when it's uh, related to critical stresses instead of velocities. The way you relate velocities to stresses has to do with the shear and the variation of the water with depth, but that's pretty well constrained by coastal engineering approaches. Another thing I've read about lately, which is interesting, is that um, in rivers and coastal areas, the maximum height of some types of sand waves is related to the water depth. Um, often, sand waves can grow to about one-tenth the water depth, but not much higher because of some ways that then distorts the flow of the whole water column. So uh, that's one way in some environments to constrain the likely amount of bed change offshore is that um, uh, it's very hard for sand waves to stably grow in marine environments to above about one-tenth the water depth. Thank you very much, Carl. We've received a number of questions that we're not going to have time to answer right now. Uh, we'll leave it towards the end. But uh, some of the questions were related to corrosion studies. And um, I just would like to point people to the CERTOP ESCCP website. There are a number of very good corrosion studies that have been done, and that literature can be accessed on the CERTOP ESCCP website. Uh, and with that, uh, we'd like to move on to the second speaker in this webinar series, um, Dr. Joe Calantoni is the head of the sediment dynamics section in the Marine Geosciences Division of the Naval Research Laboratory at the Stennis Space Center in Mississippi. His section performs basic and applied research leading to advanced technology development and demonstration and validation efforts focused around the physical, mechanical, and acoustical properties of seafloor, estuarine, and riverine sediments. Joe is internationally recognized for his novel approach to sediment transport modeling and simulation. In August of 2009, just a fun fact here, uh, Joe initiated and continues to direct a K through 12 education outreach program to promote science, technology, engineering, and mathematics in the communities uh, geographically local to the Senna Space Center. And with that, we welcome you, Joe, and turn the floor over to you. Thank you, Rula. Um, thank you, Herb Nelson, for having me on today, and thank all of you for joining in. So let's see if I can command the technology. Okay, so let's talk about the project team, there's a large number of folks here at NRL who participated in this work with me. Uh, of particular importance, of course, is our engineers who we could not maintain equipment and put it in the water without. My co-PI on the project is Alex Sheremet from University of Florida. Alex is an expert in wave modeling. And his students, Tracy and Uriah, have been uh, very closely working on the program with us. They both served as science divers. I have to thank Jesse McNitz from the uh, U.S. Army Corps of Engineers at the field research facility where we performed an experiment in the second year of this project, and I'll uh, talk about that. The entire staff at the FRF was fabulous. They really went above and beyond to accommodate our um, extreme demands in the uh, harsh winter that we spent there just a few months ago. And um, 
Diane Foster from the University of New Hampshire also participated in the uh, field experiment at the FRF. Her student, Megan Wengrove, has been uh, fabulous to work with. She also served as a science diver. And of course, we've been working with Rob Holman for a long time as well, and he's been participating in this work. So the agenda, we're going to do a quick statement of the problem. I think most of us on the call have a good idea, particularly after the introduction from Herb, about you know, why we're doing this work. Give you a little overview of our approach. I'll show some observations of mobility and burial from our first field experiment, and that's mostly in form of a movie that I'm going to show you. And someone asked about UXO reorienting with the flow. You will actually see some of that happening during a storm event in our uh, observations. And I'll take a little sidebar and I'll talk about granular sorting physics, which is a topic that I've been working on my entire career to some extent. Then we'll talk about the more recent experiment we did where we actually saw some extreme burial of munitions during um, large storm events. And we'll end up with the uh, sorting diagram is what I'm calling it right now, which is our first attempt at trying to explain the fate of munitions and mostly just focusing on this sorting physics for sandy sites. And of course, some you know, broad conclusions to hope can hopefully convince you that we've solved all the problems of the world with this little study that we did here. Okay, so the problem statement, I would sort of ignore all those words on the left and just focus on the thing exploding on the right side of the picture. So I think if there's any kind of site managers, anybody who is involved in the program on the call, this is probably something that you don't ever want to see at your site. Uh, thankfully, in this case, no one was injured, but the um, explosive ordnance disposal folks, the EOD folks, had to come in and dispose of uh, some, some articles, some rockets that washed up on a beach in the UK last year. And so this is really the, the risk, the problem that you know, CERTIP and EFTCP need to understand and manage and maintain over time. So our approach, as you know, Herb mentioned at the beginning, was to obtain observations uh, underwater in the natural environment of munitions mobility. And what we really wanted to focus on was also measuring the waves, the currents, and the sediments simultaneously at high temporal frequency as well. So we focused on sandy sites, and so please, everything that you hear me say as I go through the talk, keep in the back of your mind that at a sandy site, at a sandy site. That will be the focus for all of the results. Um, we did an experiment at Panama City Beach, Florida, which we'll just call a low wave energy environment for now, and then more recently worked in Duck, North Carolina on the Outer Banks in a high wave energy environment. And then we'll close up with some thoughts about this conceptual model for the fate of munitions. And we're just trying to look at a few important parameters that we could hopefully get a lot of traction out of. And when you're talking about the munitions, uh, we think the density and some length scale, probably the diameter of the munitions are going to be most important. And you know, most of the munitions of interest um, do tend to have some kind of symmetry axis to them. They do tend to be elongated. And so they do tend to have um, you know, a diameter that's, that is a dominant length scale. And then, of course, you know, being the sediment dynamics section here at NRL, we are always interested in the hydrodynamics and sedimentology and how these things couple together. So a quick look at the, uh, and this is supposed to be pronounced T-REX 13 field site. I didn't put it on the slide, but T-REX stands for Target and Reverberation Experiment. And so we like to call this a um, experiment of integration, if you will. It was a collaboration between 12 institutions, primarily funded by ONR and CERTIP. It was led by um, some colleagues of ours from the Applied Physics Lab at the University of Washington. And this is what we're calling our lower wave energy environment. And if you look at the picture on the right, there's two X's there going offshore. So we actually deployed two instrument frames. We call them our quad pods. I'll show you a picture in the next slide. And one was in about seven and a half meters of water. The other one was in 20 meters of water. And so we're going to focus on results from the seven and a half meter quad pod because that's where most of the action was. So just to give you an idea of what this instrument platform looks like, here's a picture of one of the quad pods. 
um, going off the back of the RV Walton Smith. If you look out at the sea, you notice it's pretty calm. So yes, we had very nice conditions to deploy. Uh, that is actually me standing in the middle of the image holding the rope. So I do go out in the ship and um, fortunately don't get very seasick anymore. But uh, we had our instrument frames out for just about five weeks uh, from April 20th through May 23rd. There's a long list of instrumentation that was attached to each one of these quad pods that went out. There were two of them deployed. We're going to focus on uh, data from the sector scanning sonar and from the, um, the, the wave data as well coming from our, from our AWAC. So I'm going to attempt to play a movie for you. And um, this is something I wanted to include. One of our divers went down right after we deployed the, um, the quad pod at seven and a half meters and did a little filming for us. And it seems like, you know, Sometimes you go out in locations and the divers have no visibility at all, which was usually the case in our second experiment. And then other times you have really beautiful visibility, as you can see in this video here. And so uh, the diver is doing a survey of the frame. You see another diver kind of peek into the image for a second there. And what I want to draw your attention to is um, this instrument that's coming into focus here. This is one of our ADVs. And you'll notice the, um, the height it is above the seafloor and some sand ripples. So it's something like six to eight inches above the seafloor. And you can see here some optical backscatter instrumentation to uh, measure sediment transport. And then the diver is going to swing out, and now you're going to get a good view of our target field that was laid down. And so when you're looking at the target field, the leg of the instrument of the instrument frame to your right is the leg that contained the sector scanning sonar, and that's the data we're going to look at in a minute. And then the leg that's to your left here in this image as you're looking out from underneath the frame, that's the leg that you're going to see a shadow of in the uh, sonar imagery that we'll look at in a second. So what about these targets that you see there? So I like to call these surrogate and replica munitions. So the reason why I put, made two distinctions here is that surrogate munitions were designed to have not only the overall size and shape, but also the correct uh, bulk density and as close as we could get to the actual rolling moment of the real thing. And then what I like to call our replicas, they have the right size and shape, but they're made of, typically made of solid materials and have a different density. We put out things that were, you know, polyurethane, plastic that were just a little more dense than water to things that were constructed of solid stainless steel that were much more dense than the sediments in the water. And you see some pictures of them on the right here. We've got um, at the upper picture is a uh, 25 millimeter round, and so that's the the projectile and the casing still there. Um, in the middle, we've got a 81 millimeter mortar. So those two, the upper ones, are what we would call our surrogates. They're designed to have the right bulk density and rolling moments. And then beneath that are some different uh, density uh, 155 millimeter howitzer uh, replicas, and the bottom one is the surrogate. Okay, so I think the first video went well, so we will try a second video, and we'll see how we do here. Okay, so I'm going to pause this for a second so we can set up what you're looking at before we get too far into it. So if you look at the panel uh, at the top, so start at the upper left, what you're looking at is a plot for the entire experiment time, 33 days, of the significant wave height and this is at our seven and a half meter quad pod. And so the, um, you'll see this, as you look at this, you may wonder, this was like the uh, Goldilocks experiment. You know, there was just one storm, it was right in the middle, and uh, as you'll see from the data, it turned out to be just the right size too. So the line is colored using the color wheel in the upper left, and that's the direction that the waves are coming from. So if you look at the peak in the middle of the plot, it's sort of a light blue, and that would indicate that waves were coming from the, um, the southwest. And below that plot, 
is your uh, sector scan sonar image. And if you look at the right edge of the image that has the big blue circle next to it, that, that edge of the image is roughly parallel to the shore in this case. And you'll see that long dark shadow there along that edge, and that's the shadow from the leg of our instrument frame. So now I'm going to let this play, and what I'll point out is that um, you'll, if you watch the sonar imagery with me, you'll see ripples form, right? So when the wave height reaches a certain value, ripples form. If you start at the, just draw a line down the center of the sonar image, starting right at the top, you can kind of discern that there's a mortar sitting right there on the edge of the image. The big target just below that is a 155 howitzer. And so now hopefully I have your attention. So we're going to slow down the sonar imagery and look at what happened during the storm. So those two big targets that you see, they're going to first be reoriented with the flow. They're going to spin, and then they're going to roll. And they approximately roll offshore. And then the more interesting thing is right afterwards, the sand wave comes in and effectively buries the entire target field in place. And so we'll look at this one more time. And if you look almost in the middle of the sonar image, there's actually a really bright spot. Those are the fins of one of our mortars. After the targets spin, which they're going to do right now, and then they roll, you'll, you might notice that that mortar did not spin. It just kind of got drug along the bottom in place. And again, the sand wave comes in and buries the target field. And so now we, um, we got to go down with our science divers right after the storm on May 8th. And this is that ADV that you saw that was about six to eight inches above the seafloor. Now it's half buried. And what tipped off that our targets were buried, here's our solid aluminum 155 howitzer. And if you look closely, you can see a sand ripple crest diving down to the bottom of the image. So it was sort of buried in a migrating bed form. So the targets were reset, and you'll see one more wave event happens that resets the ripples, and then the biology comes in and slowly decays them, and the waves stayed very quiescent, and the targets did not move. And so there's, for people who are interested in sand ripples, like a lot of us here at the lab, there's also a lot of other data in, embedded into this set with dealing with sand ripples that we're looking at. Okay, so let's um, pivot a little bit and talk about physics for a second. And Carl mentioned, uh, thank you, Carl, for setting up my discussion on the density, the role of the density of munitions. So I've been interested in granular sorting for a long time and how it pertains to um, sediment transport. In fact, Chris Baxter and I published a paper in 2006 looking at you know, different uh, size grains, for example, and how they transport differently when they're mixed up. And there's an old uh, physics paper that looks at something called the Brazil nut effect. So when you take your can of mixed nuts and you shake your mixed nuts, the big ones come to the top, and that sort of also has the underlying assumption that all the nuts are the same density. Well, physicists have gone and beat this down, and as you change the density of the larger objects, which now they call the intruder objects because they tend to bury in as you shake the container. And so we can think about munitions behaving in a similar way, despite the wide range in size between sand and an 81 millimeter mortar. When you agitate the sand bed, and if you agitate it very violently on a length scale similar to the munition, it will bury if it's more dense than the sand bed. And that's sort of the physics that's driving our analysis here. And we did a simple lab experiment before we even started this project to kind of demonstrate this phenomenon. So what I did was, I scaled the sediment using um, nylon beads, and then we um, put in a series of cylinders that were 10 centimeters long by 2 centimeters in diameter. And the blue cylinder that you see in the upper right there is, is a nylon cylinder. The black one is just slightly denser. It's a delrin plastic, and there's an aluminum, and there's a stainless one that's off to the right. And so when we turn on sheet flow in our little laboratory tank and we generate a couple centimeter thick mobile layer on the order of the thickness of these uh, cylinders, what you see is what's in the plot there in the lower right, and that is that the nylon cylinder that's the same density as the sediment never is able to bury. And the more dense cylinders bury more deeply as a function of their density. And so the horizontal axis there is the relative density of the cylinder to the sand bed, and the vertical axis is the non-dimensional burial depth, non-dimensionalized by the size of the munition. 
So we thought, you know, the same physics has to work in the natural environment, but you'd need some pretty extreme conditions to generate very large uh, amounts of sediment moving around to test this idea. So we went to uh, the Army Corps of Engineers Field Research Facility in Duck, North Carolina this past winter, and we got exactly that. Um, this was a very energetic winter, and we were able to deploy two instrument frames, and you'll see they were out for quite a long time. From The first frame went out on January 26th. We finally got the second frame in on February 4th, and then had a, a little window the week of March 9th where we were able to recover our instrumentation. And one of the things we did here was we cabled the sonar at the 8 meter array back to the pier. And so we were able to monitor uh, the sonars in real time. And so because of the sort of unique place we were working and the cable operation, we, you know, we followed the lead of the experts at the FRF. And this, here you see this picture. This is a custom array that they um, designed and built for us. We called this our horseshoe crab. And so you see the crew carrying it out of the, uh, the garage there. And here's another version of it. Uh, sitting down. If you look around the base of the frame, you'll see um, some collars with some screws. So the way this works is that the, um, the, the boat with the wheels behind it, it's called a lark, and we, uh, we deploy it off of that lark. So we picked it up with the little boom there and, and drove it out into the water, and we drop it down. And when it sits down, the seafloor divers then go down with some long pipes, and they jet them through these collars and then tighten down the bolts, and we hope that it holds the, uh, the frame in place. And it, it turned out that it did, but it was, it was close. There was definitely some what we call jacking of the frame during the very intense storm events. This whole frame was bouncing up and down just a little bit on the bottom, despite the, pack, the fact that it had four pipes jetted uh, 12 feet into the seafloor on it. And so those were some big waves. And just to give you a visual, idea of what those were like before we look at the data. The, um, these are images from the Argus camera system, the tower there, that they, off the tower that they have at Duck. And that yellow arrow in the picture on the left, that's actually the location of the lark, the little speck that you might see if you squint in the image, is the lark deploying our 8 meter array. And on the right, this is what the uh, ocean looked like, the coast looked like during the largest storm that we had on February 10th. That's also the, uh, around the same time that picture was taken of me that you see, that you saw at the beginning of the talk. I took that picture from the end of the pier, nothing like a extreme storm event selfie to motivate your talk. Um, so what did the waves look like? Well, if you start down at the bottom panel here, this is now significant wave height, sort of uh, same kind of plot that we looked at previously in that movie that I showed you, except here I put a dash gray line to indicate the peak wave height during the T-Rex 13 experiment. And what you notice if you look very closely is there were no less than six events during the time we were out that exceeded the uh, peak wave height of T-Rex and another four events that came awful close to it as well. And the big one was, you know, right after the 10th year ramping up, you see we got um, we got as much as over five meter wave heights over the top of our instrument frame. And I just want to point out above that these were longer period waves, certainly a lot longer period than what we saw in Panama City. The period there, the peak period was more like eight seconds, and here the peak period is more like 14 seconds. And so these longer period waves, um, they work the, the, the seabed over quite a bit more and, and as you'll see, can have quite an impact on burying our targets. Okay, so something really interesting to me, and it's going to motivate some of the analysis we're going to talk about in a second, is that the um, the bathymetry, and this is these are a pair of profiles taken by the FRF. This data is courtesy of the FRF. Thank you, Jesse McNinch. Uh, they did a line survey over the, the transect that our instruments were located right before the experiment began, and then another line survey right after. 
And the um, locations of our two instrument frames are noted with these uh, horizontal, or I'm sorry, these vertical dash dotted lines here that you see. And the interesting thing is that there was really no change in bathymetry at the 8 meter array over the entire winter cycle that we were out there. And just very little, very small change at the, um, at the 6 meter array. And so there's something that um, coastal engineers call a depth of closure, for example. And it would seem like our 8 meter frame was uh, beyond the depth of closure, which means that the beach typically doesn't change much out there. And to kind of really bring that point home, uh, I got a plot here from the folks at the FRF. And this is the depth um, 700 meters offshore along that transect that we were just looking at. So it's kind of right in between our two instrument frames. And yeah, if you look at the horizontal axis, you really are looking at nearly 35 years of elevation data for this location. And what you see is that over a 35 year period, the bed there wibbles up and down a little bit, but it hasn't changed by more than about 25 centimeters. So, you know, what, what we like to say is something like this, that you can, at a place like Duck, for example, you can roughly partition the, the beach into two parts that we're going to call uh, bathymetrically stable on the right and more bathymetrically active on the left. And I just kind of arbitrarily, you know, drew this line here um, demarcating these two regions based on that previous plot at 700 meters. But I'm sure the, um, you know, we could come up with a more rigorous way or have a gray area in between that's sometimes active and sometimes stable if you wanted to, to get more specific with it. But I'll, I'll come back to this in a second. So let's talk about the munitions that we had out there during these uh, intense storm events. So we had the same range of munitions that I showed you before. And what we did this time was we used some acoustic pingers. So you see this pair of hands of my technician holding uh, a couple acoustic pingers. The ones on the right, the really small ones that are smaller than your pinky, those were embedded in the um, in some of these little, littler targets, the 20 and 25 millimeter, they were also added to floats. If you look at these little yellow strings here attached to these larger targets, we put little pingers in floats um, and had them floating above the, uh, the larger targets. And then, of course, these larger pingers were also attached to the large targets as well. And we put out all of these targets at the 8 meter array. And on February 4th, when we deployed the 6 meter array, we added one more of these large targets on the right. And that's kind of um, important because what happened was everything buried in place. And so there was some lateral mobility, but if you're sitting in an office right now, the targets never got out of your office, you know, unless, unless your office is um, much bigger than mine. Um, so the, what we see here is on the horizontal axis, we've got that relative density of the munitions. And on the vertical axis, we have, a, again, this uh, non-dimensional burial depth. And of course, this is non-dimensionalized the same way as before by the target diameter. This is the field version of that laboratory experiment that I showed you earlier. And you see the points have the same kind of behavior. Uh, much deeper depth, this triangle all the way down here, this is actually our 81 millimeter mortar, our stainless steel mortar, and that was buried a full two feet deep. Um, so having the pingers actually is what paid off the most because we went out there to look for, the divers went out to look for targets and couldn't find anything, and we turned on the pinger finder and we could hear them all talking to us. So we knew they were there. So we got out, the, um, the divers had a hydro lift, and it was a very tedious, kind of arduous process. But we got out the hydro lift, and we spent two days excavating the field site, and we were able to recover all of the large targets and a couple of the small targets as well. And these two stars here are actually two of the smaller targets. And those, those were recovered from the six meter array, I should say. So what can we do with this information? 
so back to this sort of conceptual model for the fate of munitions that really just focuses on the density and of course is really going to be applicable where you have sandy sediments that can sort, that can sieve these larger particles and sort them down to the bottom of their active layer. Um, the bulk density of the munition and some length scale, right now we're using the diameter of the munition. And then the sediment density, of course, is what we're normalizing the, um, the target density by, the UXO density. And then just something that for now I'm calling the activity parameter, which is basically a physicist's way to say uh, that's all the physics I don't quite understand or can't characterize real easily. I'm just going to dump it into a parameter and get some model going. Additionally, we think partitioning sites into two regions, uh, stable versus active, and of course if you have uh, a coral reef or something then you might not have such a, so much of an active region but it might all be fairly stable. Of course that might bring in other problems. But the hypothesis here is that munitions will be trapped in a state of perpetual burial with, I'll say, very low probability, I don't want to say zero probability of escape, in stable bathymetry regions. So at the eight meter contour at Duck, for example, I, my bet would be that if we did not excavate those munitions and we came back a year later, two years later, three years later, and we had enough batteries on our finger, we'd still hear them in the same spot talking to us. They may go a little deeper as storms get bigger and drive them further down into that active layer. And then in these more active bathymetry regions, as you go closer to the shore, the probability becomes finite and I don't know that it would grow linearly, but it certainly would grow with the growth of our quote unquote activity parameter. So just to take this one step further and I haven't tried to put the points, the data points on this graph yet, but when I do I expect the points that you just saw to kind of sit somewhere in this region here, okay, in this entombed region and they probably started out scour burying and then end up somewhat entombed. Um, but this is what we're trying to head towards, a non-dimensional phase diagram for the fate of munitions. And of course, again, you have the density ratio on this axis, and on this, this axis you have a ratio of length scales, one of which is the munition, the other which is this activity parameter. And like I said earlier, this activity parameter effectively, you know, it just takes all the physics in that we, that we know is there, but that we're not going to try to model explicitly at this level. And so then um, I am out of time, so I will just end with some conclusions, and that is that we observe mobility and burial. Um, we hypothesize that munitions are likely to be trapped when you have stable bathymetry, of course sandy bathymetry. We think this sorting diagram could be very valuable once we start populating it with points from our uh, experiment and other experiments that have been done for these active bathymetry, bathymetrically active sites. And we hope that these measurements and modeling will support some estimation for site contamination as part of what, what would be a larger risk assessment um, model or system that site managers will use in the future. And thank you. Thank you so much, Joe. We have a number of questions, and I'm going to try and read them off to you. Uh, for starters, we have a question related to munitions burial. Uh, once the munition is buried, you said it's likely to stay buried. Can you elaborate on what type of event would cause this munition to be visible again? So to answer that question, I will go back to um, this slide for a second. So I think when munitions are buried on this half of the profile, they are very likely to be buried and stay buried and what might break them free. Um, surprisingly, when I looked at this graphic from my colleagues at the Army Corps of Engineers, when I see these sharp gradients where the bed made rather abrupt changes, I immediately thought, oh, were these from hurricanes? But my colleagues informed me that no, it, the, the big events, the singular big events typically don't have that effect. What has this kind of effect apparently are prolonged periods of continuous storms, like similar to what we had this winter, which you know the data is not on this graph yet, is we had a 
sequence of as many as 10 nor'easter storms in a three-month period, and that tends to be what would have the um, higher probability of potentially lodging something free. Now, this all also assumes that the sediment supply is going to be stable for these sites. You know, under pressure from uh, global warming and sea level rise, that could have an effect on sediment supply, and that could change the physics of what we're looking at as well. Thank you, Joe. Um, would the sorting diagram that you developed uh, still be valid for non-sand sediment type? I would like to think that we can include the physics for uh, muddy cohesive sites into our activity parameter or perhaps have a sister diagram that was valid for muddy sites. And then of course, you know, Carl talked about rocky or um, more hard bottom sites that, you know, that's sort of a different, different animal altogether. But any time there's some kind of sediment that can bury, I would like to think that we can create a diagram. I, I hope that we can create a diagram like this with a little more data and just a little more thought that will at least provide a good rule of thumb for, for the folks out there who have to make these tough decisions to, um, to try to go by. Great. Um, all your measurements seem to indicate that the munitions just vary. Are there any other field measurements of more mobility in the active bathymetry region that you can highlight for us? Yes. Um, that's, that is a great question. And so back to um, this diagram here, you know, we, we only stopped here at the six meter. We did not go into this what is the more typical surf zone. Now, of course, during the storm, the surf zone extended pretty far out. But um, our colleague, uh, Peter Trukowski at Woods Hole has been leading a project. And they've been looking in tidal shoal environments and energetic surf zones off of Martha's Vineyard. And if you downloaded the PDF for today, there are a few slides that I was able to include at the end that Peter sent to me um, from some work that he's done. And they definitely see, I think, what we want to look at is this slide right here. Down here, these are tracks of um, UXO mobility. So certainly up off of Martha's Vineyard, they saw targets uh, UXO, surrogate UXO or replica UXO moving around quite a bit in the surf zone there. So yes, there, there are, as you get closer to the shore, things tend to be more uh, laterally or horizontally active. Thank you, Joe. Uh, can you discuss in a little bit more detail what role the grain size of the sediment plays in the mobility and burial process? So this physics of granular sorting, once the ratio of the object, in this case the UXO, is much greater than the size of the sediment, which unless we start talking about uh, 81 millimeter mortars or 25 millimeter rounds in cobble on a cobble beach, um, any sandy or cohesive sediment beach, this, this ratio of grain size to uh, UXO diameter is always going to be uh, saturated, you know, out, of, out on the far end of the curve. And it, it really, the, the grain size is not important. What, you know, transitioning from non cohesive to cohesive sediments certainly would be important. But the grain size itself will not be important until it becomes order one of the size of the mobility. So cobbles, for example, would certainly have you know some different a different effect here. It would take way much more energy to um, sieve these large UXO down into a cobble bed than it does in a sand bed, for example. All right. Thank you, Joe. We have some questions that both you and Carl can possibly answer. So in Carl's final conclusion slide, he mentions that the measurements and modeling will support risk assessments. And I'd like to know um, what your vision is for a risk assessment system for underwater sites. And perhaps, Carl, you can start by weighing in, and we'll turn it over to Joe, please. Sure. Um, yes, I think that uh, one of the things that Joe pointed out is that the risk assessment 
would have to have different regimes that are quite distinct based on some uh, large scale parameters, like whether the bed's fixed or the bed's sand or if it's mud. Um, I think that uh, the, the, the goal is of the expert system that I'm tangentially involved in is to provide the guidance that would um, classify on a broad sense, and then once you're in a, you know you're in a given regime, you can use, if you're in a regime where um, a weight, the density is dominating, you can use relations from um, some work that's been done there, like Joe's work, or if you're in a system where um, scour is dominating, which is the case for, can be the case for quite large uh, munitions, like mines, for example. Um, if uh, the field work has shown that even in pretty energetic areas, they're so big, they can't penetrate down below the, the layer that is um, being fluidized, so they don't disappear. Um, so depending on what regime you're in, you could use uh, pretty well constrained or reasonably constrained relationships for the different regimes. So I think uh, it's important to recognize in guidance that different environments have different rules, and uh, that will be a challenge because there's never going to be one simple relationship that works in every situation. Joe, can you please add to that? Um, all right. Um, I'm sorry. I think, sure. from the, I think from the physics side, I agree 100% with what Carl said. And I think when we start talking about risk assessment systems, there's certainly a, a lot of other factors that site managers are going to need to weigh. Um, just, you know, how do they get all the environmental conditions that they need? How do they have those readily handy? And how, how do we visualize these things in a geospatial environment that provides information to the end user that is of value and not cluttered with, a, you know, a lot of extra extraneous things that inhibit the ability to make a decision? So. The larger risk assessment thing is a problem that I think our mobility studies are just, you know, we're, we're providing hopefully some very important and relevant physics, but there's a lot more work that needs to be done by other folks on the computer science side and human factor side, I think, to help people actually develop a system that, that can really be robust and valuable across a wide range of sites. Thank you. Uh, another question for both of you. What would you recommend that CERD do next? to help advance effective remediation of UXO contaminated sites. Could you repeat that one more time? I'm sorry. Yeah. What do you recommend that CERDA do next to help advance effective remediation of UXO contaminated sites? Um, and maybe we can start with you, Joe. Okay, well, that, that's a hard question and probably uh, a little above my pay grade, but since you asked, I guess I'll, I'll try to provide an answer. Um, I'm not completely familiar with the entire portfolio, but certainly just coming at it from the mobility and modeling point of view, um, there certainly are a range of environments that we haven't considered yet from the, uh, the, the modeling side and the experimental side, such as the Army has a number of sites in rivers and lakes, for example, and there are, uh, you know, this issue of cohesive sediments. We've focused our work on sandy sediments. Uh, Peter Tchaikovsky is focused on sandy sediments. I know much of the lab work has been focused on hard bottoms or sandy sediments to this point. And so different sediment types and different environments, at least on the mobility and modeling side, need to be uh, still need to be looked at, I think, before we have a clearer picture of the entire problem to address the full range of sites that are out there that need uh, risk assessment done on. Thank you. And Carl? I agree with uh, everything Joe said there. Um, I like the, especially the emphasis on real-world sites. Um, often in the lab, although it's invaluable because of the control of the parameters, you end up, you might end up obsessing over a problem that ends up being overwhelmed by something else in the real world. So if you go in the real world, I would, I would recommend and be excited about 
sites that are looked at that really do have a history of problems with UXO and look at what the issues are in these real sites. Um, for example, the people hadn't really addressed uh, the, the effect of um, density of heavy UXO under extreme conditions like the massive storms at Duck because it was something that was just really hard to do in a lab and they, people were working on the more doable situations. But when you go to a real place, then you see what has to be thought about. So one of the um, very different real places that's not too far from where I am is in the Potomac, the tile Potomac uh, in Maryland. There's some sites near Army facilities that have a lot of contamination from test firing. And uh, those are areas that have pretty low wave energy and larger tidal energy and tend to be mixed sediments that are more cohesive. So I, I think that that would be an exciting place to go, for example. All right. Well, thank you, Carl, and thank you, Joe. And on behalf of SORTUP and ESCCP, I'd like to thank our audience for attending today's webinar. As a reminder, the presentation and audio will be archived for future reference on the SORTUP and ESCCP webpage. The next webinar is on Thursday, May 28th, and it will focus on new tools for characterizing and remediating munitions and, and, and energetics at military ranges. This webinar will feature two speakers, Dr. Tom Jenkins and Dr. Paul Hasinger. Just a quick reminder um, that the, to please complete the survey, the very short survey, that will pop up on your screen when we conclude the webinar. Um, and uh, we thank you in advance for your time. Uh, this concludes today's webcast. Thank you.